Good morning. Welcome to today's webinar entitled Hearing Conservation Overview. My name is Dane Sprankle. I'm a safety and health consultant with the PA OSHA Consultation Program. The purpose of today's webinar is to provide a basic understanding of OSHA's hearing conservation requirements, as well as strategies for reducing noise exposure and an understanding of the ways that hearing loss occur. Chat will be open during the webinar. If you have any questions, please feel free to submit them via the chat feature. If due to the technical nature of some questions that may require more thorough response, those types of questions will be answered and posted to our website within seven days of the airing of this webinar. And the webinar itself will be posted there as well for future access. The outline for the presentation includes the following main subjects, the definition of noise, ear anatomy, types of hearing loss, OSHA regulation, and methods to control noise exposure. The basic definition of noise is unwanted sound. Sound waves are moving variations of air pressure. The waves develop when a vibrating surface forms areas of high and low pressure and those variations are transmitted as sound through the air. Noise is measured in two different areas. One is wavelength and the other is amplitude. Wavelength is basically the frequency of noise. And by formal definition, it's the distance traveled by a sound wave during one sound pressure cycle. Higher frequency, which is also known as pitch, would have a shorter wavelength. And loudness of sound, appears as amplitude on the, the sound wave. And the, that is affected or uh, controlled by the amount of the air pressure variations, which is a result of, of stronger vibrations. Put it another way, the greater the sound pressure level, the louder the noise. And it's measured in decibels. This graphic shows how noise and frequency appear based on a waveform of the noise. The top two images show different amplitudes. The one on the left shows a shorter uh, amplitude or a shorter height of the wave, which would be quieter. And the image on the top right shows what would be a louder noise, it shows a, a larger amplitude, and the wave extends higher above the line. The bottom two images show pitch or frequency. On the left, you have a short, or I'm sorry, a deeper pitch and a longer frequency, a longer wavelength. And on the right, you have a shorter wavelength which would equate to a higher pitch and a higher frequency. One of the unique characteristics of noise measurement is that it's measured on a logarithmic scale rather than a linear scale, which means that every increase of five decibels is actually a doubling of the sound pressure level and therefore the loudness. So if you start with an 83 decibel noise source and double it, the result would be 88 decibels. 92 decibels is twice the energy as 87 decibels and so on. From that, it follows as well that if you double 
the noise source, you only increase the noise level by five decibels. And this graphic shows if you have two noise sources that are 100 decibels each, and the subject is equal distance from both of them, that the resulting noise level would be 105 decibels, not 200 decibels. So that's an interesting aspect of noise. It, similar to uh, various types of radiation that it follows a logarithmic scale. Right, moving on to the next section of the presentation, the anatomy of the ear. There's three sections to the ear, the, the external or the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. The outer ear is what, what you can see as well as the portion of the ear canal up to the uh, eardrum. The middle ear, the main structures are listed there, but it's air filled and there are three bones, the malleus, incus, and stapes. And there's also the eustachian tube that goes from the middle ear into the throat and uh, its purpose is to balance pressure inside the ear in the middle ear with atmospheric pressure. And then the inner ear is the fluid filled area and it contains the main structures, the cochlea, the semicircular canals and the, the hair cells. The hair cells are actually where hearing takes place and that, that's what um, in the case of occupational or noise induced hearing loss, that's where it occurs is with the hair cells. The types of hearing loss, two types, conductive and sensory. Conductive hearing loss affects the outer and middle ear and basically it interferes with the ability for sound to be conducted from the outside through the middle ear to the inner ear. The multiple re reasons that those types of hearing losses can occur include excessive wax in the auditory canal, a ruptured or damaged eardrum, fluid in the middle ear. Um, that's why, um, especially with uh, children that have to have tubes in their ears, if they have ongoing issues with fluid um, not draining from the middle ear. Dislocated or missing elements of the ossicular chain. Again, that would be the three bones that we mentioned in the previous slide. Eustachian tube blockage, which again would uh, likely lead to uh, pressure issues and potential fluid um, accumulation. And otosclerosis, which is an abnormal growth of bone in the middle ear. Conductive hearing loss is, is not real common in a work environment, but it can occur there. Some of the situations that could cause such a uh, type of hearing loss would involve uh, a, a ruptured eardrum or a break in the ossicular chain by a head blow, an explosion, a rapid pressure change in a decompression chamber, for example, or penetration of the eardrum by a sharp object or fragment. Many conductive hearing losses are reversible through medical or surgical treatment. And the second type of hearing loss is the sensory hearing loss, and that's where the damage occurs to the inner ear. And it's typically due to degeneration of the neural elements of the auditory nerve it initially appears um, on an audiogram as, as loss, hearing loss above 2000 hertz. And it tends to peak at around 4000 hertz. Now there's two types of the sensory hearing loss. One is reversible, that would be the temporary threshold shift. And an example of that would be um, if you, if somebody goes to, for example, a rock concert and for a few hours or maybe for a day after that, they have trouble hearing that that's a temporary threshold shift, but it is reversible. 
a permanent threshold or a permanent sensory hearing loss um, at an a averaged out at 2,000, 3,000, and 4,000 hertz is called a standard threshold shift. And that normally, if it's going to happen, it, uh, re it is based on the occurrence of multiple temporary threshold shifts. Some of the other effects that noise can cause aside from hearing loss are effects on communication and performance, uh, annoyance, difficulty concentrating, absenteeism, accidents, um, ulcers, increased blood pressure, hypertension. A lot of these are more um, um, subjective, but, uh, but they are known and they, uh, these types of effects have been uh, shown to be directly related to excessive and long-term high exposure to noise. Okay, moving on to noise-induced hearing loss. Again, this would be a, um, a threshold shift of permanent nature. Some characteristics are that, uh, that it causes no pain. So uh, somebody who's suffering um, over time, a noise-induced hearing loss would not typically feel pain. There's no visible trauma, no visible scars. And it's typically not noticeable in the early stages. It accumulates with each overexposure and normally takes years to notice a change. And the key uh, caveat there is it is permanent and it is 100% preventable. It's considered the most common occupational illness in the United States. And roughly 22 million US workers are exposed to hazardous noise at work on a daily basis. And out of, uh, or currently uh, roughly 8 million Americans suffer from noise induced hearing loss. And that's based on an IOSH data from 2009. This is an image showing the internal ear. Um, on the left, you see the, the hair follicles of a healthy ear. And these hair follicles, again, are um, what becomes damaged over, over time due to repeated temporary threshold shifts. And on the right, you, you see the hair follicles that are damaged and again, um, with daily and, and long-term exposure, those hairs will will bend and uh, relax and, and they'll recover um, to an extent, but eventually they don't recover. And that's when you move from a temporary threshold shift to a permanent threshold shift, because once they're fatigued to the point that they are in the image on the right, the hearing loss at that point is, is permanent. Moving on to the OSHA requirements. The standard is uh, within the OSHA regulation for general industry is 29 CFR 1910.95. The exposure limits are, there, there's two limits. There's a permissible exposure limit and an action level. The permissible exposure limit is 90 decibels over an eight hour uh, average uh, averaged out for an eight hour workday. The action level, which does require action on the part of the employer is 85 decibels. And again, that's an eight hour average. And that's where the hearing conservation measures have to be implemented. And um, the majority of action is required at the action level. The PEL is when additional action has to be taken. And one thing to note on the action level that even though it's 85 decibels, that's for an eight hour workday. For extended work shifts, the action level is reduced using the formula listed there. Examples using that formula, um, the bullets at the bottom there show a 10 hour, 12 hour and 16 hour shift. 
what the action level would be. Um, as you can see, it reduces with each additional uh, time added to the, the duration of a normal eight hour shift. And for it, for the out for nine hour or, or 14 hour or any any uh, shift duration, you can use the formula to calculate what the action level is, but there's tables, uh, multiple sources that you can refer to um, for, for any pretty much any shift duration. Um, if you'd rather not have to try to do the calculation. So an additional um, OSHA limit is an impulse limit of 140 decibels. Nothing above that is permitted. And there's also uh, controls prescribed depending on what the exposure limit or exposure level is. And the engineering controls are admit engineering, I'm sorry, the controls are engineering, administrative, PPE slash hearing protection, and annual hearing test to determine if your program is effective in preventing hearing loss. Now this image and the following image just show um, based on the, the the logarithmic scale of decibels and the, the doubling, the five decibel uh, doubling at 90 decibels, eight hours is the exposure limit, the PEL. And if you go up five decibels to 95 decibels, you cut that maximum exposure duration to four hours. And if you went up to 100 decibels, it would reduce to two, et cetera. So um, it gives you a good idea of uh, the maximum. A permissible uh, time in a given uh, environment if you know what the exposure or the, the sound levels are. The devices used for monitoring noise exposure are a sound level meter shown on the left and a noise dosimeter or personal dosimeter shown on the right. The sound level meter um, is typically used for identifying loud noise sources within a, in an environment to focus if you're going to try to determine uh, areas where you can maybe reduce exposure by engineering controls or lay out a facility to, to minimize noise to the extent that you can. They're not real good for determining eight hour exposure limits unless you have a known um, continuous noise level um, you know, and a worker is is positioned in, in a in a pretty well defined spot for the majority of their workday. The dosimeter on the right is more accurate and more um, desirable for monitoring to determine eight hour exposures because it does integrate all noise levels and it's worn directly by the worker, so it's, it's capturing what they're actually exposed to. And if there's intermittent noise, or if there's uh, a lot of worker movement from, uh, say, a punch press to, uh, to a raw materials uh, storage location or a welder that maybe welds and grinds, um, the dosimeter will give you a much more accurate reading of what the employee is exposed to, and it gives you an average exposure over the the duration of the uh, time that you monitored for. So again, that would be more desirable um, if there's intermittent noise or if it's variable exposure, if there's a lot of worker mobility, and uh, it's normally um, would be used in that regard and the, the sound level meter would be used as a supplement um, just to check for louder equipment and again to uh, maybe determine ways to reconfigure the work environment to reduce overall noise exposure. And this is an image just showing some different uh, noise producing uh, equipment and, and uh, materials that uh, and, and what the, the resulting levels would be. You note on the right the uh, hearing protection required by OSHA that's that's at the 90 decibel level. 
hearing damage or ear damage possible for basically in the 85 decibel, 75 to 85 decibel range. The hearing conservation program, that's when you have a known exposure that is above the, the action level, OSHA requires you to implement a hearing conservation program. And remember with the action level, if, it's an, if employees routinely work extended shifts beyond eight hours that the action level would be reduced for those employees. And the four main elements of the hearing conservation program include annual, actually baseline and annual audiometric testing, annual training, hearing protection, and the noise standard or a, uh, a version of the noise standard um, has to be posted for employee review. And for employees who are exposed above the permissible exposure limit, which is mentioned earlier is 90 decibels, hearing protection has to be mandatory and it has to be adequate based on the noise level as com compared to the noise reduction rating of the hearing protection being worn. And it does have to reduce noise exposure to below 90 decibels, 90 dBA. For employees who do have a confirmed age corrected standard threshold shift in either ear, based on the um, annual audiometric testing, they have to be informed of that result. They have to be provided hearing protection that attenuates their exposure to 85 or below, as opposed to 90. They have to be required to use hearing protection and they have to be retrained in proper use of hearing protection. Regarding the audiometric testing, some key points here. Um, the standard requires a 14 hour quiet period prior to the test. Obviously you can't control what employees do off the job, but you would wanna let them know um, if, if they're gonna be tested the following day, um, advise them to avoid significant noise during their off hours. And if they are working a double shift or something, then it wouldn't be appropriate to test them the following day, at least not in the morning. Um, and I really, because of the known higher noise exposure at the, on the job, um, you would wanna delay a test for somebody like that to, to either Monday or till two days after they had, the, uh, had worked the double shift. Baseline test has to be completed within six months of being hired. And again, that we're referring to employees that are exposed above the action level. There is an exception for companies that use a mobile test van that they can be um, tested. They have to be tested within 12 months of, of their first day being exposed above the action level. But keep in mind that employees um, like that uh, where they have started working, but they haven't had their audiometric test yet for the baseline, do have to be required to wear hearing protection until they get that initial baseline test. The audiometric tests have to be completed on an annual basis. And the, the company that does the testing would be responsible to evaluate the results and compared to the previous test to let you know if there's uh, anything that would require either a retest or possibly a medical evaluation. The audiometer that is used by the testing company does have to be calibrated according to OSHA requirements. And during the testing, at least at the beginning of each testing uh, cycle or testing uh, session, background noise levels have to be monitored by the company doing the testing to ensure that background sound levels 
do not exceed those listed in table D1 of the OSHA standard. Retesting uh, for an employee that, that shows a threshold shift after their initial annual audiometric tests, the employer can have them retested, but that has to be within 30 days of the first test. Um, that would be something where, um, for example, if you have reason to believe maybe that an employee had a temporary threshold shift, um, you know, from off the job exposure, or if you felt that there was something that may have contributed to them um, appearing to have a threshold shift that it, it would be uh, worthwhile to retest to see if, it, if it's actually um, results come out the same the second time. And referral, um, that would be made by the audiometric technician, a physician, audiologist, otolaryngologist, um, based on a problem audiogram, something that may appear on an audiogram, such as a potential conductive hearing loss or uh, something else that may uh, be beyond a noise induced um, or an occupationally induced uh, hearing loss. So that would be, uh, again, that would be the referral by, by one of the professionals involved in the testing. And in that case, the employer would have to let the employee know that they need to, uh, to have further evaluation completed. And this this slide shows an example of an audiogram from an employee who suffered, or anybody who suffered a noise-induced hearing loss. <clears throat> you can see that their threshold levels are, are in this case, at zero. In reality, they probably wouldn't be that low, but but you would see a notch around 4,000 hertz in that area. That's indicative of a noise-induced hearing loss as opposed to a conductive hearing loss. For a conductive hearing loss, the hearing capability would be roughly the same across all frequencies rather than just at the higher frequencies. Okay, record keeping. For a standard threshold shift that reduces hearing ability to 25 decibels or more above audiometric zero in the same ear as the standard threshold shift, it has to be recorded as a hearing loss on the OSHA 300 log. Audiometric zero is the average hearing level at 2,000, 3,000, and 4,000 hertz. So um, it would have to be, in this previous slide, it would have to be um, at 25 decibels average on at those three frequencies, 2,000, 3,000, and 4,000 hertz before it would be considered um, uh, uh, meet the criteria for recordable. And again, it would have to include um, a, a standard threshold shift um, as defined earlier in the presentation. Employee training. Uh, this is something that has to be done annually in addition to the annual audiometric testing. Um, so it has to be done initially as well and then annually thereafter. And the main areas it needs to cover are the effects of noise on hearing, proper selection, use, and care of hearing protection, and uh, more specifically, what is available and required or made available on a, on a voluntary basis when uh, applicable um, at, at the given work environment. And the purpose and procedures of audiometric testing. The training, a lot of times the companies that do the audiometric testing will provide the training as well, but that's something you need to um, make sure uh, as you, when you're uh, uh, contracting, whichever company is gonna do your testing, that number one, they can provide it. Number two, that it meets OSHA's minimum requirements for what is covered. And uh, a third point there is you wanna make sure that they document that they did the training and what was covered and they provide that 
to you so that you have a record that it was provided and when and what was covered. And, um, ideally, it would also include a description of uh, how it was provided, if it was a video or um, discussion, a pamphlet that was covered, um, but it can't just be handing somebody a pamphlet and uh, treating that as training because that doesn't meet the minimum requirements of training. Controlling noise exposures. The hierarchy of controls um, listed here is the same hierarchy that would apply to any workplace hazard, what noise or um, machine guarding, um, any hazard uh, that occurs in a workplace. These are the preferred order of uh, controlling those hazards. The first one is engineering. If you can engineer the hazard out, in this case, the hazard being uh, high exposure and exposure to high noise levels. Um, ideally, that's uh, what you would do because uh, once you eliminate the hazard, then it's corrected permanently. The second tier would be administrative noise controls. And that would be things like worker rotation. I'll go into more detail in a few slides on that, but, um, but that would be the second preferred method of, of control. And the last preferred method is personal protective equipment or hearing protection in this case. The next slide shows um, some different types of engineering controls and also information for uh, purchasing equipment that um, ideally, uh, if, if you're purchasing new equipment, that's something where you would, um, if there's an, a comparable piece of equipment that that is known to be quieter or produce lower noise levels, um, that, that's what you would want to purchase. And the link there um, is the Buy Quiet Roadmap that uh, has information about equipment that's been actually monitored, measured to determine what is quieter um, and what, what may be applicable or useful in a work environment that uh, where you're able to control it from the beginning, from the purchase, uh, from the beginning of purchase, um, rather than having to deal with equipment that's already in place. Proper maintenance, um, that's extremely important in controlling noise levels, lubrication, tightening bolts, um, loose, Loose uh, metal, for example, vibrates significantly and then normally does add uh, significantly to noise levels. So um, especially with older equipment, you want to make sure that you're, um, you're following manufacturer's recommendations in terms of lubrication and uh, belts and, uh, you know, again, bolts and things like that that may become loose. You want to make sure that you, you check those periodically and make sure they're tight. Another engineering control is vibration pads. Enclosures are, um, are useful in some work environments and they could be around the worker or around the noise source. Barriers, such uh, different types of acoustic materials, curtains, walls, um, things like that, maybe that uh, in some cases are portable that could be placed between employees and more significant noise source. Isolation as well, which is similar to enclosures, but um, that could include distance as well. If you can locate an employee further away, if it's an open environment, um, that's an option. And here's just some images of different noise controls. Uh, on the left, you see an enclosure around a piece of equipment with acoustic material inside and a safety glass in front to uh, direct noise, especially high frequency noise, back inside the enclosure. On the right, there's a electric motor that does not have internal damping, that uh, springs were added underneath it to provide external damping. A couple more images here on the left. Uh, it's a uh, you see materials dropping into a bin and uh, the design included rubber flaps to slow down the descent of the, the product and a low fall height to minimize the force whenever the product falls into the bin. 
And on the right, you see a conveyor dropping material into a hopper, and the hopper design included resilient damping layer, um, as well as a heavy duty abrasion resistant inner skin, again, to reduce um, vibration and to absorb noise. The next slide, we're looking at administrative controls, and here's some examples. Uh, reducing exposure duration through either um, having employees switching tasks. This kind of falls under rotating workers as well, but um, you could spread loud tasks across multiple shifts if that's something that would be feasible, or rotating workers from half a day maybe in uh, in a loud area and half a day in a quieter area. You can look at revising work practices and employee positioning. Again, this kind of goes um, hand in hand with the with the engineering uh, in uh, with laying out the work site in a way that uh, minimizes um, high accumulate or high congregations of loud equipment. Um, you can do the same with the workers as well if you can spread them out and uh, keep them as far away as possible or possibly um, in conjunction with your other engineering controls, um, get them in a location where they're not uh, as close to noise sources as they need to be or maybe changing the flow of equipment or material through the facility just to uh, minimize employee exposure. And then training would also be an administrative control. And we, as we already discussed, that would be mandatory uh, based on the um, being exposed above the action level, but uh, additional training addressing um, things like uh, where you stand while you're working. Do you need to stand as close as you do to, to a given piece of equipment? Um, distance is a, is, a, is a very effective means of controlling noise exposure and uh, for employees that tend to maybe stand uh, right next to a machine if they don't need to, um, you know, that's something that is definitely uh, worth covering uh, in a supplemental training session. Um, another option that I didn't have a picture of it, but in the engineering section is locating controls for equipment, relocating them further from the, the uh, point of operation where the loudest noise occurs, if, if the control panel can be relocated. And again, that, that kind of goes back to employee positioning. Okay, moving on to personal protective equipment. In this case, it's hearing protection. I'm just going to talk a little bit about the different types and the, some of the benefits and the positives and negatives of each type. The, uh, the first one is ear plugs. In uh, general description, they're dis disposed, uh, that, I'm sorry, um, they need to be disposed of daily, not uh, ideally. They should not be reused from shift to shift, especially the, the foam type plugs. If they are multiple use, uh, make sure that they're, the employees clean them properly with mild soap and water and let them dry. And also inspect the multiple, multi, or I'm sorry, multiple use earplugs um, for dirt cracks, um, things like that. And, and if they're damaged to replace them. Bands are the least effective of the types of hearing protection available, but they're probably uh, preferable for some employees uh, in terms of convenience and when exposures are, aren't significantly above the exposure limit because they are um, easier to take on and off and uh, they can be stored around the neck when not in use as opposed to in a pocket. And again, as I said, uh, under the cons there, that they do have lower attenuation than most earplugs, and they can actually transmit some noise through the band itself because it's a rigid band. 
earmuffs. Uh, the pros for earmuffs are they're easy to get a proper fit. Again, they're similar to the bands, they're good for intermittent noise and for radio and electronic operations if need be. For example, a crane uh, uh, signaler. The cons, they can feel hot and heavy with extended wear and uh, compatibility with other PPE, um, in particular certain types of respirators or possibly uh, welding uh, mask, things like that. Uh, the, they may not be compatible. So you have to look at uh, the compatibility as a potential factor in uh, whether they're even something feasible for your work area or work environment. For care and maintenance, again, uh, for similar to any, uh, any uh, multi multiple use hearing protection, they should be cleaned regularly with mouth soap and water. The cushion should be replaced every four to six months with normal wear and if it's uh, under extreme uh, wear, maybe more often and uh, do not overstretch the headband. Noise reduction rating is the rating on any type of hearing protection. It uh, gives you an idea of how much protection that, that, that device will provide some limitations on noise reduction rating to keep in mind. Um, those ratings are based on ideal lab testing. And uh, the noise reduction rating has been criticized because it's too, by many, for being too generous in its prediction of noise reduction in real world environments. Most workers probably do not achieve the full um, noise reduction rating in actual use. It's, it depends on um, being worn properly and um, being maintained properly. So there are derating methods to compensate for, for operator or user error as well as uh, just improper uh, wear, improper uh, earplugs, for example, that aren't inserted properly. But over the years, there has been a lot of confusion in knowing how much protection you actually get strictly using the noise reduction rating for a given type of hearing protector. This shows an actual re noise reduction rating for hearing protection. Um, as you note there, a laboratory estimate of the amount of attenuation achievable by 98% of users when properly fit. And that's, that's a laboratory based and in a laboratory environment. But note that it is a population based rating. So some users will get more and, but frankly, uh, the majority will get less than the actual noise reduction rating. Some of the methods for, for derating hearing protectors. Um, OSHA has some um, very specific guidelines and uh, in Appendix B, the, uh, the rating, the listed rating is used as the, the basis and then subtract seven from that to determine what type of attenuation is actually achieved in the field. And, and again, that's OSHA's uh, method to derate. In cases where an employer does not or cannot implement engineering controls when noise exposures exceed 90 decibels, and there, there's very specific guidance on how an employer can, or, the steps an employer has to take to justify doing that. Um, but in those types of cases, you have to subtract seven from the noise reduction rating and then divide by two for to provide a safety factor of 50%. Um, and again, the method for determining when you have to use this method is very specific and uh, um, any questions that are uh, 
provided uh, during this webinar about that. Um, I'll do my best to provide an answer, but again, there's a requirement to do a, a, an economic uh, and um, technological assessment to determine the feasibility of engineering controls versus a hearing conservation program. And, um, and that only applies when exposures are above 90 decibels and that's using a 90 decibel monitoring threshold as opposed to an 80 decibel threshold, which um, again, it gets pretty confusing, but, um, but any questions that you have about that, please uh, include them in the chat and uh, I'll get you an answer. There is a NIOSH method. NIOSH is not a, a regulating body, but they do have recommendations and um, using their method for derating hearing protection for earmuffs, they recommend that you only um, utilize 25% of the noise reduction rating. For formable foam earplugs, 50%, which is a safety factor of two. And for ribbed uh, rubber type earplugs, they, they recommend that you utilize 70% of the noise reduction rating is the maximum uh, real world uh, attenuation for those types of hearing protection. That concludes the discussion on hearing conservation. Um, this is our website, our home page, and um, we would highly advise or recommend uh, that you check it out. There's a lot of information and uh, you can see on the left, uh, there's some video V tools, focal points, uh, short videos of different topics, including hearing conservation. Um, with the, the current coronavirus situation, there will probably be some additional information added. Um, we do have a webinar um, that we completed for, for COVID and uh, it, is on under the uh, the webinar tab, and there will probably be some virtual, um, additional virtual um, services that we're going to be able to offer here in the near future. Again, based based on the the uh, COVID um, situation, so that we can still provide offsite assistance to the fullest extent that we're able during this crisis. This page just uh, has links to our website, our Facebook page, Twitter. Uh, we have daily updates on Facebook. Um, our phone number is there. Thank you for tuning in to the webinar. Our next webinar is scheduled for July 15th of 2020, and it will be addressing confined spaces in construction. Thank you again for attending.